Professor Kim is the author of Riding Manhood in Black and Yellow, Ralph Allison, Frank Chen, and the Literary Politics of Identity, published in 2005 by Stanford University Press. His talk today, however, draws on his second book in progress, titled The Korean War in Color. Um, by focusing our attention on the rarely discussed question of race at the heart of that conflict, Professor Kim brings into view the zones of ambiguity and the kinds of encounters that have tended to elude our inquiry till now, such as the Afro-American soldier from Dixie South who discovers an unexpected brethren in the yellow race as he fights on the battlefields of the Korean War, um, and also chooses to repatriate to China rather than return to life under Jim Crow. A uh, very interesting figure. Uh, as well as Japanese Americans and Japanese as they were portrayed in mainstream American media as the Korean War waged on. His work allows us to see how formative the Korean War has been in shaping not only Korea and East Asia under Pax Americana, but also mainstream America and its ideologies of race. In the process, Professor Kim's work opens up a very productive way of bridging scholarship in Asian studies with scholarship in American studies, not to mention Asian American studies. So I'd like to turn the mic over, but before I do that, I should add a biographical detail that I know will warm your hearts to him even before he comes up here and speaks a word. Uh, once a Wolverine, always a Wolverine, they say. And Professor Daniel Kim uh, is a graduate of Huron High School and the University of Michigan. <laughs> Uh, and he was here last Saturday to cheer on the Wolverines as they cremated uh, the San Diego State. Uh, I think it's now our turn to extend a cheer to uh, Professor Daniel Kim. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you so much. Um, it's really r great to be here. I actually, I'm a townie. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, I, li I lived here from kindergarten through senior year of College, so it's um, I, my family's moved away, so it's been uh, it's been a really nice visit. Um, I'd like to thank Youngji for inviting me and the Nam Center uh, um, for for this this wonderful experience, and um, Nojin for um, his hospitality, and also David, um, and also of course Chi Young for doing all the arrangements. Uh, she's been great. Um, also, uh, you know, it turns out um, I went to Korean language school with Elder Nam's kids. Uh, Andy and Tony Nam, we used to go to the Methodist Church on Saturdays to try to learn Korean. Um, so it's, 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 it makes it, a, it gives it this extra dimension, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm a scholar in Asian American studies and American studies, so um, I'm just exploring how my project might speak to or be enhanced by East Asian studies. So I'm, I'm very curious to, uh, to get feedback on this, uh, on this work. On October 5, 2007, the Washington Post ran an obituary for Al Chang, a well-respected combat photographer who had just passed away at 85. Included in the tribute was a photograph which is described as one of the enduring images of the Korean War. Taken on August 28, 1950, it, quote, shows a distraught soldier who has learned that his replacement as a radio operator has been killed. In vivid contrast, it also shows a corpsman in the background sifting through casualty information with apparent detachment, end quote. If Chang's is the most famous American photograph of the Korean War, what makes it so exemplary is the fact that there's practically nothing about it that seems to identify it as such. Indeed, what makes it such a discomforting yet moving image is that it seems to speak to something universal about the modern experience of war, something that has to do with the juxtaposition between the open and anguished intimacy of the two men in the foreground and the apparent detachment of the man in the background. But this third man's seeming obliviousness might be said to point to something more historically specific, namely the obliviousness on the part of most Americans concerning the Korean War. For however powerful it may be, Chang's photograph does not have the iconic status of certain other images of war. The raising of the flag on Iwo Jima, the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima, or a naked girl running in terror from her napalm village in Vietnam, just to name a few examples. 
the ubiquity of these late latter images is a sign of how central to American historical memory these other conflicts have become. The relative obscurity of the former image, by contrast, registers the fact that what Americans mainly have left of the Korean War are a handful of phrases untethered from any easy, easily visualizable referent. The 38th parallel, the demilitarized zone, the forgotten war. Perhaps it's the chronolo chronological bracketing of the Korean War by these other more dramatic conflicts in Asia that explains its relative invisibility in American culture. For it would seem that the Vietnam War, with its immediately traumatic significance, has shaped and even perhaps displaced any uh, historical sense of the <laughs> earlier conflict that Americans might possess. And the fact that it took place a mere five years after the end of World War II suggests how it's been overshadowed from a different historical direction as well. But if the Korean War seems to lack the dramatic, world-shattering significance of either World War II or the Vietnam War, at least to Americans, if it fails to register a weighty enough sense of its own discrete eventfulness, this is not a consequence of its essential insignificance. Rather, the inability of Americans to form a clear picture of what the war was reveals as much about the way in which we, in which we think about the period, um, the early years of the Cold War, as it does about the event itself. If Americans have become somewhat like the soldier in the background of Chang's photograph, not quite looking at an event of some significance and sorrow that has taken place before us, then part of my aim in the larger project um, from which this talk is drawn is simply to ask us to shift our gaze. I hope to turn, uh, return American readers to the time in which this photograph was taken, to provide a sense of what cultural meanings this event took on as it took place to develop a picture of what the Korean War looked like to Americans before it was forgotten. And so doing what I'll reveal is not a paucity of artifacts, neither a ghostly absence nor an <coughs> emptiness. After the, all, the war was not exactly conducted in obscurity. It was entered into, the full no, into with the full knowledge and initial support of the American public, if not exactly its formal consent. The propaganda machinery that had been developed during World War II still functioned as a potent force in 1950, and a significant body of material in the conflict was generated by Hollywood and the mainstream press during the fighting, very little of which questioned its justness um, in any significant way despite its increasing unpopular, unpopularity. In returning us to American culture during the time of the war, I intend to draw attention to something that's not quite visible in Chang's photograph, but that might begin to emerge in our field division when we consider the ramification of the photographer's ethnic and racial identity. Chang was Chinese American. To visualize another thread of intimacy that this image invisibly traces. For if the anguish and the comfort that are the subject of this photograph remain unseen and unacknowledged by the soldier in the background, they are seen and acknowledged by the man who stands behind the camera. To the extent that he participates in the drama of shared loss that he records, Chang implicitly invites us, um, Chang implicitly invites us oops, sorry, to glimpse an interracial dimension of the intimacy he depicts. What settles onto and around this image, what lies behind the, behind, beyond the edges of its frame is an Asian American subject who's joined to the white American subjects whose drama his camera records. Looking at this image in the way I'm suggesting is made easier when we look at how Chang was memorialized in a very different kind of newspaper. The obituary that ran in the Honolulu Star Bulletin also refers to the photograph included with the post obituary. However, it includes a different image, this one, uh, which is contextualized by the observations uh, of retired Brigadier General Erwin Cockett, who recalls how Chang, quote, really made the 5th Regimental Combat Team, which was made up of a lot of guys from Hawaii famous with his pictures of the fighting in Korea." End quote. And bringing these two photographs together, I offer a sense of how I look at the materials um, that I address in the larger project. In order to present anything like an adequate cultural history of this conflict, it's necessary to confront the pivotal role that this event played in Asian American history and in African American history. I therefore try to bring into focus how black and Asian subjects functioned in journalistic, literary, and cinematic representations of the Korean War. It is this dimension of the war, the vital, though oddly overlooked role it played in the American history of race, that the book I'm writing seeks to shed light on. For in racial terms, the Korean War was undeniably a watershed event. It was the first U.S. military conflict in which combat units were racially integrated, in which black, white, and also Japanese-American soldiers fought side by side. 
For, moreover, Thurgood Marshall, um, just a few years before he argued on behalf of the plaintiffs in Brown v. Board, was dispatched to Korea by the NAACP to, to investigate charges that black soldiers were being court-martialed at disproportionately high rates. The great foment in domestic race relations that the Korean War catalyzed took place within two overlapping global frameworks. There was, of course, the Cold War. The Manichaean struggle between capitalism and communism. The conflict was, in this context, uh, the first proxy war between the U.S. Um, uh, that the U.S. fought to contain the Soviet menace. And in this struggle, the, the place of minorities in the U.S. had a big part because to the extent that the U.S. could show that it was racially inclusive, it could demonstrate the superiority of the American way over the communist way. And to the degree that interest was focused on continuing racism, this sort of assisted the Soviets in their propaganda war. Um, but in addition to the Cold War, we also need to think of the period as the era of decolonization. Um, and in this context, I mean, this is the period when all of the colonies, um, including Japan, including Korea, are being um, liberated. Um, and it's therefore instructive to think of the war as military historian Alan R. Millet insists as one of several Asian wars of decolonization that began during World War II, to see it as a three-phase Maoist war of national liberation in which two competing parallel political movements, neither strong enough to stand alone, started their struggle to prevail in 1945 to 1948. And this is very much in line with Bruce Cummings' account of the war. Um, Timothy Brennan has observed that an imaginative geography governs the cultural differences related to civilizational contests, the East-West as Rudyard Kipling understood it, as well as the world political context of the Cold War as Nikita Khrushchev or later Ronald Reagan understood them. Brennan suggests, in other words, that the cultural mapping of the communist East um, that of the communist East that the democratic West engaged in was overlaid upon more well-known imaginative ge geographies that were de developed in 18th and 19th century colonial discourses. In other words, the East-West conflict of the Cold War was overlaid with the North-South conflict that we think of um, when we think of uh, the period of uh, colonization, and also in relation to a long-standing Orientalism um, that gets rewritten in the period. Uh, of the Korean War, of the Cold War. Uh, Christina Klein has written a book called Cold War Orientalism, which talks about the emergence in the mid-50s of a particular variant of American Orientalism. Um, and it's a period, she points out, in which um, Asians and Asian Americans became very popular, especially in middle-brow culture. And one of the things she points to is the fact that a number of the Rodgers and Hammerstein's musicals that became famous in the period are set um, in, in Asia or involve Asian characters. South Pacific, The Flower Drum Song, The King and I. Um, and the way that she reads these films is she says what's being mobilized in these narratives is, uh, is a logic of integration. Um, and it, this logic of integration has both a domestic uh, agenda and also an international agenda. Domestically, the U.S., as we know, was was engaged in the struggles of uh, around integrating racial minorities into the U.S. Uh, body politic. But internationally, the Cold War period was a time when the U.S. was attempting to integrate the third world into the first world economies, to create free trade zones, say, for instance, in East Asia, in which um, U.S. hegemony would sort of go hand in hand with, uh, with the emergence of, 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 of free, uh, cap free markets. Um, so Cl Klein basically uh, argues that instead of simply thinking about the Cold War in terms of containment, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the wall, the, the, uh, the Iron Curtain, Bamboo Curtain, these sorts of metaphors in which the struggle is to contain the Soviet Union. She proposes that we think of the Cold War as a time when the, when the U.S. and the Soviets were sort of competing imperial powers, attempting to integrate the third world, the decolonizing world, into their uh, sphere of influence. Um, the material that I'm looking at my study, um, in the way that I look at it, I tend to emphasize the integrationist cultural logic that's at play. Um, American newspapers, magazines, and movies, as well as the African American and Japanese American press, tend to treat the war as an occasion to reflect on the ways in which the racial integration of the military might presage a more inclusive American social order and on the role that the United States might play in integrating third world subjects into an internationally integrated free market economic order. Reflecting the emergent Cold War liberal consensus, the vast majority of Korean War representations tend to share the ideal of integration in its domestic, transnational, racial, and political senses. 
Um, so to give you a sense of how I look at the materials I look at, and to give you a sense of the materials that I look at, I'm going to talk about what's generally thought of as the first uh, U.S.-Korean war film, which was filmed in the early days of the fighting. It's by Samuel Fuller, and, it, Fuller, and it's called The Steel Helmet. And it's released early in 1951. Um, when the film was re first released, it was attacked by conservative critics and reviewers because they thought that it did not present the U.S. military in a positive light. Um, it was a huge hit. <laughs> Samuel Fuller made a lot of move, a lot of money on this movie, and um, and because of that, I think we can say that it, it, there was something about the way that the film framed the contact con uh, the conflict in the early days that that audiences found compelling. Um, in his autobiography. Biography he describes the origins of the project this way. Um, he want, I wanted to convey the genuine hardship of soldiers, theirs as well as ours, and to depict the confusion and brutality of war, not phony hor heroism. I concocted a squad of GIs cut off uh, in Korea, cut off behind enemy lines. They're of different races and backgrounds. Together, they must assault a Buddhist temple, now an obs enemy observation po po uh, post as part of a big offensive operation. Sergeant Zack, uh, who's the hero of the film, is a retread, um, and a retread is the term that was used uh, to describe World War II veterans who were fighting in the Korean War. Um, and the steel helmet, the film itself is a bit of a retread because it recycles a lot of the conventions of the World War II combat film. Um, and in fact, Bassinger um, says that this is true of the genre itself, that the World War II combat film gets recycled to meet the needs of each era. And so you could go up to private, Saving Private Ryan and see this, or even Avatar, um, and see the same conventions being put into place. Um, what was interesting about the steel helmet is like you always have an ethnic mix. You've got like the Jewish intellectual, the farm boy from Idaho or something. You've got this mix of, of different types that come together in, in a unit. Um, in World War II films, this ethnic mix was always still white. Um, in the steel helmet, there's notably a black soldier and a Japanese American soldier. And this is a, this is a new wrinkle um, that, the, that, the, that the film introduces. Um, the men have been wandering um, in a long, in, in a dark fog, fog shrouded forest when they come upon Zach and two companions. Um, there's Corporal Thompson, who's a black medic, um, and Short Round, uh, who's a South Korean orphan. Um, and a piece of trivia, Short Round was the name that Steven Spielberg used to describe the kid who was in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. For any of you, if any of you have seen that movie, Steven Spielberg was a big fan of Sam Fuller. Um, Anyway, Zach Thompson and Short Round join this group of men. They're lost um, in the woods, but they find their way to this Buddhist temple, which is a, which was formerly a communist observation post. They take it over. Um, while they're in the observa uh, observation post, they see enemy troops massing, and they call in an artillery barrage. Um, the North Korean troops attack. Well, and and they find a North Korean major who's hiding in the temple. Um, the North Koreans discover where they're located. There's a there's a there's a huge attack, um, and they successfully fend off uh, the, you know these thousands of North Korean troops who are coming, um, who are who are trying to kill them. Um, uh, Janine Bassinger is a film historian who's done a study of the uh, of the World War II combat film, and she talks about the character of the North Korean major. Um, she describes him as as looking more like the German villains in World War II films. What he talks about is the fact that if you look at World War II films that are set in Europe and World War II films that are set in the Pacific, that the Japanese are vilified as a race. The Japanese are evil because they're Japanese, whereas the German, the Nazis are evil because they're Nazi, not because they're German. Um, and so her view of how these World War II films works, it echoes an argument that John Dower, this historian, makes, which is that the Pacific War, as the U.S. Ra uh, fought it against the Japanese, was a race war that the enemy as a whole was vilified racially. And it's very different than how the Nazis were vilified. Um, what's going on, I think, in, in, in Steel Helmet, in the Steel Helmet, is we have the residual traces of the racial vocabulary of World War II combat films. Um, and you see that in struggle with a new vocabulary that the film is trying to improvise to talk about the enemy. Um, and we can see a version of this residual vocabulary in this image. This is a still from the film. And this is the first moment when we see the North Korean major who's hiding in the Buddhist temple. Um, 
Now, it's hard to look at this image. If you've seen any World War II films um, uh, with the Japanese or any Warner, the Bugs Bunny cartoons where he's, uh, that were filmed in World War II, there's this figure of the buck-toothed uh, myopic Japanese soldier. And I think this is a pretty direct allusion um, to that image. So what you have happening is like this racist imagery that was developed to talk about the Japanese is just superimposed onto a North Korean communist. Um, but there's a moment of ambiguity because this is the first moment we see him and then he puts down his binoculars and you see his human face. And there's a certain tension in how this character is depicted where we see the sort of after image of the Japanese villain from World War II films and the emergence of the very sort of slightest trace of humanity. And I'm going to talk about how that works. Um, The difference then between Steel Helmet, the Steel Helmet and World War II films, we can th think about in three ways. First of all, uh, the figure of the evil Jap is embodied by a Jap is not uh, embodied by a Japanese character, but by a North Korean communist. Second, this vilified figure will develop a sense of humanity um, by the end of the film, which I'll get to. And third, the only Japanese character to actually show up in the film is a Japanese American, and again, he's one of the men in the unit. Um, a clear aim of the film is to affirm that Japanese American and African Americans um, have earned the right to be treated as fully American. It presents as the most compelling evidence of their loyalty, their willingness to kill or be killed in defense of their country. Moreover, it asserts that subjects like Thomas Thompson and Tanaka, uh, the black and the Nisei soldier respectively, despite the racism they have been subjected to, can be counted on to be loyal and helpful. Thompson and Tanaka stand in allegorically for Japanese Americans and African Americans at home. Their importance to the unit underscores not only the moral, but also the military use value of racial integration. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> in many of the cultural texts that depict the conflict, we can see an early version of what historian Melanie McAllister has called uh, military multiculturalism. And it's an ideology that sort of came, um, be, became full-blown during the first Gulf War um, and representations that emphasize the multiracial makeup <clears throat> of the U.S. armed forces, um, quote, provided the mandate for the global exertion of military power. The diversity of its armed forces made the United States a world citizen with all the races and nations of the globe represented in its population. As the military would represent the diversity of the United States, the United States, as represented in its military, would contain the world." End quote. <clears throat> so what's surprising about uh, the military multiculturalism, or what, should, uh, what was initially surprising to me, is that this multiculturalism already in 1950 includes black and Japanese American figures. Um, the first combat sequence that takes place in the Steel Helmet show showcases the teamwork of, two, of the two retreads, Zack and Tanaka, as they efficiently and wordlessly pinpoint, I mean, there's this little choreography where they're able to identify uh, a sniper and they're able to, to wordlessly put themselves in position. And so you see, um, I don't even remember exactly how it works, but this is, the th they're back to back and they take out these two enemy snipers. So we know that they're both very good soldiers and that they worked together before in the Second World War. Um, Counterparts to Zack and Tanaka can be found in what's probably the best known Korean War film, which is Pork Chop Hill. Um, and this is the actor George Shibata, who plays Lieutenant Suki Ohasha, Ohashi, who is the loyal and courageous second in command to Gregory Peck's uh, Lieutenant Joe Clemens. And there's another uh, much less well-known film called The Crimson Kimono, which is a murder mystery set in LA. It came out, comes out in the late 50s, but there's a, it's a buddy film as well, and the two protagonists are this Japanese-American and um, white American. They're, they're LA detectives, but they were together in a foxhole in Korea, and the Japanese-American soldier gave an emergency blood transfusion to the white soldiers, so they're kind of symbolically married there. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about the film, but it's a really interesting, crazy film, also by the same director. Um, um, in addition to the images of interracial brotherhood that you see um, in the steel helmet, the other sort of contribution to the genre of the war film um, we get is the introduction of 
the oriental child who attaches himself to the hero. And this is short round. Um, this, is an Im this is a moment when he's singing the national anthem, uh, the Korean national anthem, which in the original melody of that was Odd Lang Syne, and all the other soldiers are shocked that this South Korean uh, child knows the melody to Odd Lang for Odd Lang Syne. The figure of the Korean orphan, or the Asian or third world orphan more broadly, is perhaps the most enduring legacy uh, of, the, of the conflict in American culture. Although the practice not, did not originate with the war, representations of innocent and victimized Korean children in dire need of American assistance played a crucial role in framing how Americans understood the reasons for the fighting. Real life counterparts to show, Short Round could be found on the pages of Life magazine. Um, the October 23rd issue, for instance, uh, featured this photograph, and Life routinely had images of, 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 of um, young uh, Korean orphans. Um, Christina Klein's study helps us see these represent representations as part of a wider sentimental discourse and practice of transnational adoption. Um, Sentimental representations of Asian orphans and, ad and of adoptive American families, as Klein argues, quote, allowed a way to imagine U.S.-Asian integration in terms of voluntary affiliation. They presented international bonds formed by choice, at least on the part of the American parents, rather than by biology. In doing so, they foregrounded the idea of alliance among independent parties, the model of post-war integration, rather than the idea of an empire unified by blood and force. End quote. The notion of a family in which Americans played the paternal and maternal roles and in which Asians were seen as children, quote, balanced emotional unity with internally structured hierarchies of difference based on age. It served as a model for free world community that included both Western and non-Western developed and underdeveloped, established and newly created nations. The family became a framework within which these differences could be, uh, be both maintained and transcended and offered an imaginative justification for the permanent exclusion of U.S. Uh, extension of U.S. power figured as responsibility and leadership beyond the nation's borders. A short round is the only um, South Korean character who, who has a substantial role in the steel helmet. His young age and innocence has seemingly instinctive affection for the curmudgeonly Zack clearly distinguishes him from the character that the film identifies as his opposite, the devious North Korean. And that's basically the primary character of the North Korean, at least through the first part of the movie. He's a foil against which these images of more loyal and heroic uh, um, people of color can be projected. So you've got, again, the black medic, the Japanese-American soldier, and short round, the Korean orphan. Um, a major concern in the film happens uh, is how do you tell short round from the North Communist major? How do you tell the Koreans that are allied with us from the Koreans who are fighting against us? Um, the way that the film tries to make this distinction, in, in, in trying to make the distinction, this, the film ends up relying on language of law. Um, and now I want to turn to my talk to talk about how this works in the film. Um, the film's primary concern is with an optic of detection and differentiation, with the ability to be able to distinguish between those non-whites who, who are to be killed and those who are not. This distinction is, in fact, a cornerstone of the body of laws governing the conduct of war. The Steel Helmet is obsessed not only with the issue of who constitutes a legally killable subject, but with the issue of legality more broadly. Um, it's worth taking a moment here to consider the relationship between the law and war. The state of war constitutes, by its very nature, a state of legal exception. During war, the laws, um, rendering, the laws rendering the intentional killing of other human beings an egregious criminal act are within certainly pu certain putatively clear and stable limits temporarily suspended. As Nathaniel Berman has noted, one of the key doctr doctrines of the body of laws that govern the conduct of war concerns what's called the combatant's privilege, the provision of legal immunity for certain kinds of large-scale violence. More, more recently, in the wake of 9-11 and Guantanamo, it's the term legal combatant uh, that circulated in American culture. But this term, according to Berman, identifies those, uh, the, act the actual term within legal discourse, uh, according to uh, Berman, is the combatant's privilege. So the combatant's privilege um, 
refers to an international law immunity that places some violent actions and actors substantially outside the pur purview of normal criminal law and human rights law. Those who benefit from the combatant's privilege cannot be prosecuted for mere pros uh, participation in armed conflict and are entitled to prisoner of war status. Um, that's Berman. So subjects who qualify as legal combatants are then also subjects who can be legally killed. Within the laws governing war, um, and, just war and also in just war theory, the issue of distinguishing between those who are legally killable, killable and those who are not is connected with the principle of discrimination or distinction. For the rules of war to be observed, it's necessary to discriminate those in legitimate possession of, possession of the combatant's privilege uh, from those who aren't. In theory, at least, there's one way of making, uh, one clear way of making this distinction. And the following pass, uh, like basically what it boils down to this, what, what you need to show, what you need to do to show that you are entitled to the combatant's privilege is to, you, you have to be displaying military insignia. In other, in other words, to be a legal combatant, you have to have a uniform. You have to have a clear sign fixed at a difference um, that makes clear to the enemy that you're a legal combatant. Um, so in the, he the Hague and Geneva, Geneva Conventions, um, uh, the military insignia is defined as, quote, a fixed distinctive sign visible at a distance. Um, as I'm going to show, the Steel Helmet is really interested in this issue. During the Second World War, the issue of whether Japanese subjects were mili wore military uniforms or not was rendered somewhat moot. As John Dower demonstrates in War Without Mercy, Americans came to believe that it was not only Japanese, Amer Japanese fighting men who were worthy of extermination, but civilians as well. The sense that Americans were not particularly interested in distinguishing between Japanese combat combatants and non-combatants non partly explains why the hundreds and the explains why the hundreds and thousands of civilian deaths that were the consequence of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were acceptable to American military planners and to the American public at well, as well. But by 1950, no particular Asian racial uniform could serve as a fixed di distinctive sign designating the legally killable enemy because it was no longer possible to distinguish between friendly and malevolent Asians on the basis of nationality. By the time that hostilities erupted on the Korean Peninsula, Japan was in the process of being redefined as the most important American ally in Asia. And the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces by Red, Mao's Red Army made clear that not only were there both friendly and hostile Chinese, but that there were far more of the latter. And Koreans, well, few Koreans knew who or what they were. Only that, as with the Chinese, some of them apparently yearned for freedom while others had tragically embraced communism. This racial uncertainty emerges most forcefully in the film around the question of how American fighting men might distinguish between North Korean enemies and South Korean allies. While um, the ending of the film will offer the final word on this issue, much of the film seems devoted to making clear that it's a certain relationship to legality, to legality, to the law, that differentiates between those who are with us and those who are against us, between those who are morally worthy of being killed and those who should be saved instead. Um, we find out in the opening, in the opening scene of the film, um, we see, we, when we're introduced to Sir, the character of Sergeant Jack, Zach, he's the only survivor of his unit. The rest of his, um, the men in, the, in his unit have had their hands tied behind their backs and executed. And this was, this was uh, carried widely um, in the U.S. press, and so it became evidence of North Korean um, e criminality, actually, because they were violating uh, the crimes, uh, the, the, co the laws of war in terms of how you conduct a war. Um, legality is also, um, the first North Koreans you meet, you actually see are dressed at, in white pajamas and they're worshiping at a Buddhist shrine and then they open fire. So again, that's another violation of the laws of war. So we have this association between North Koreans and, and criminality pretty much from the outset. Um, but this question of crime, of the law, of legality, it's not just about war crimes that the movie um, sort of addresses the issue of law. It also frames how we think about the, the, the racial minority subjects that are part of the unit. Um, the first time we see the character of Thompson. This is the first time we see him. He emerges out of the fog, and you can't really tell his racial identity. But what you see, you, what do you see? You see the white, the, you see the red cross. You see the insignia 
that identifies him as a medic. It's highly visible from a distance, right? So his racial uniform is less salient here than his military uniform, which again identifies him as a medic. Um, and this tells us something about Thompson from the outset, that not only is, a, is he a soldier, but he's a soldier who will follow the rules of war, who will follow the laws of war. Um, and this sets us up for uh, this. I'm going to show you two scenes, um, which I think are pretty uh, remarkable, because um, they establish, uh, again, the link between um, Thompson, uh, if I can get this to work. Here we go. Can you hear that? Um, you know, what you notice in that scene, I think, again, is the, the, is the cross. Um, and if, in the way the camera revolves around, like, you know, if you think about it, then the North Korean major is also wearing a red insignia on his helmet, the, uh, on his hat, the, uh, the communist star. Um, but the, the, so that what I, what, what's interesting to me about that scene is the way in which that juxtaposition works. Like, black and Asian are sort of put in these opposing, um, and putting this opposing stance, um, and the illegality of the North Korean becomes all the more visible when we see the cross, the red cross on the black soldier's helmet, which, and again, he's doing what he's legally obligated to do as a medic during war. He's taking, he's tending to the wounds of a prisoner, prisoner of war. Um, Of 
I mean, when I saw that for the first time, it was, I, I just didn't think Asian Americans were in any Hollywood movies, um, you know, in the 50s. So, you know, there's, that, there's just that. But anyway, the, the thing that's interesting to me about that is the, in, in the earlier scene, the two bodies are like this, right? And in this scene, the two bodies are like, like this. So what you focus on is the fact that they both have Asian faces. And both those actors probably play Japanese in World War II films, you know? Um, so the, the, the viewer is sort of made to be, see the, 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 the sort of racial similarity between the two. And again, the difference between the two then gets written as a difference of a relationship. They have different relationships to the law, right? He doesn't beat up the PW, POW even though he wants to. Right, we have rules in this country, um, and so the language of legality is the, ends up being the most important thing in that scene. I think. So in the end, it's a willing adherence to laws, and even to those one knows to be unjust, that defines and unites Thompson and Tanaka and distinguishes them from the North Korean. If current laws, uh, which in the context of 19, um, if current laws, which have been. Con if current laws, which have been given constitutional sanction by the Supreme Court's Plessy versus Ferguson decision, force Thompson to sit in the back of the bus, he's willing, nonetheless, to abide them, abide by them for another 50 years or more, if necessary. Of a past law, an executive order issued by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1942 and upheld by the Supreme Court in 1944, forced Tanaka and his family into an internment camp, it was a law he was willing to follow. And in the current context, both men prove themselves to be soldiers who will abide by the international laws that govern the conduct of war and the treatment of prisoners. That the very first Korean war film placed such an overwhelming emphasis on the law is no coincidence. For indeed there was, from a legalistic point of view, something unprecedented about this conflict. It was the first of several undeclared wars that the United States waged during the latter half of the 20th century, and of course into this one as well. It entered into hostilities with North Korea not through a congressionally sanctioned declaration of war, but on the basis of the, uh, basis of the Truman administration's assertion that the United States was compelled to take part in United Nations sanctioned police action. The newly instituted Security Council of the UN was authorized by Article 39 of the UN Charter to, quote, determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression. At the urging of the Americans, the Security Council voted on June 25th to define the North Korean attack as a violation of Article 39 and thus as an illegal breach of the peace. Um, Article 42 also authorized the Security Council to take action by air, sea, or land forces as may be necessary to maintain or restore international peace and security. So the language that the Truman and, uh, President Truman used to justify the creation of a U.S.-led U.N. military force um, termed it a police action. On June 26th, uh, the day after the outbreak of hostilities, Truman referred to the North Korean invasion of the South as, quote, a lawless action end quote, and pledged that the United States would, quote, continue to uphold the rule of law. And three days later, he characterized the North Koreans as, a, as, quote, a bunch of bandits. So the vilification of the North Koreans in the film operates on two levels. First, there's just the racism that's left over from the prior war. But secondly, and more importantly, they're distinguished from loyal Nisei and Negroes through an assertion of their radically opposed relationship to the law. The North Koreans are thus depicted not only as having committed a crime against the peace, of violating the law of war, uh, or jus ad bellum, and they're also presented as flagrantly violating the law in war, jus in bellum. These are the laws of war that govern when it's legally permissible to enter a war, and the laws of war that, that govern how you fight the war. Um, so the North Koreans, not only do they kill their prisoners, compelled captured medics, medics to minister to the wounds of their soldiers, they disguise themselves in civilian clothing and disregard the requirements that soldiers be distinguished by the wearing of military insignia. Okay, so this is all very tidy, um, right? But what makes the steel helmet kind of a typical Korean War text is that all this tidiness gets very messy. Um, the stuff that I just described kind of falls apart. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about in concluding the talk uh, now. Um, like any war film, The Steel Helmet is inherently engaged 
and a commentary on its own status as a piece of visual technology. One of the things that the film is trying to demonstrate to its viewers is how they might be able to detect the difference between the two kinds of Koreans, those who are the legitimate targets of military violence and those that aren't. But the notion that it's possible to tell the difference presupposes that there actually is a difference. And while the film insistently tells us that both of these things are true, that there's a difference and that it's discernible, it ultimately shows us something else. For the neat distinction that the film establishes between short round and the major, the representative South and North Korean characters is not quite sustained by the film's ending. A primary point of contrast is the respective characters' relationship to religion. Short Round is devoutly religious, Buddha-fearing if not exactly God-fearing, while the Major, we think, is godless. And when Short Round is killed by a sniper shortly before North Korean forces are about to storm the temple, this seems the ultimate affirmation of the difference between North and South Koreans, and the North Koreans are willing to kill a child. Um, we're, uh, we're to, we are, the viewers are asked to link the communist willingness to kill a child with the communist willingness to kill their prisoners. Both convey the North Kore Koreans' treacherous criminality. But the circumstances of Short Round's death make his death seem less like a murder, a war crime, than a legally sanctioned act of murder. When the North Korean sniper first spots Short Round, he's walking out of the temple carrying uh, wearing a helmet and boots that have been taken from the corpse of an American soldier, and he's carrying an extra rifle for Sergeant Zack. The long shot shows the viewer what the sniper is seeing. And from this vantage point, the South Korean boy looks less like the civilian he is and more like the American soldiers he is helping. These two facts, that he's wearing military insignia visible from a distance and that he's bearing arms, would seem to distinguish him as a legal combatant. It should also be noted that, given the assistance he has been providing to the American short round status as a non-combatant had actually been compromised long before the moment of his death. The actions that follow shortly upon the death of short round fully further erode the distinctions the film has so carefully made. Having placed so much emphasis on the rules of war forbidding the killing of prisoners of war, the film then has its protagonists commit the very crime that epi epitomized the villainy of the North Koreans. Um, basically, when, when uh, Sergeant Zack is supposed to take the North Korean back to headquarters, um, and he sends Short Round out to do something, but Short Round has a prayer on his back for Sergeant Zack, saying, please make Sergeant Zack like me. Um, he gets shot, and when, 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 uh, when, when they find out, like, the North Korean pulls this prayer that's been written on Short Round's, Short Round's back, um, and, and starts laughing, and so Zach just shoots him. Like, he commits a war crime, he shoots a prisoner of war. Um, and basically, and then he, he gets chewed out by his commanding officer for committing a war crime. So like, the thing that's supposed to distinguish us from then actually collapses, right? And again, Short Round ends up looking a lot more like the North Korean major because he's dressed in a military uniform, when he's an American military uniform, basically, um, when, he's when, he, when, he's, when he's shot. And then the death scene uh, we get for the North Korean, I mean, the North Korean major gets his own death scene. Um, and, I, and he dies in front of the statue of the Buddha. And his dying words are, he says to Tanaka, say a prayer to Buddha for me. Um, and what I notice, what I think is happening in the arrangement of this body is this looks like a pieta to me, right? Um, so the North Korean communist is sort of put in the Christ position in this moment, and he's revealed to be a Buddhist. And so this whole tidy structure of differentiation that the film um, spends most of the time s setting up kind of collapses in the end. Um, so it's a very non-triumphal war film in a way. You know, I mean, the men end up being successful in the end because they're able to, to, to sort of fend off the enemy attack, but nearly all of them are killed. And actually, then they, they also violate the rules of war when they're, the medic takes his medic helmet off and starts shooting machine gun, which I don't think medics are supposed to do. I don't think that's, this is something I wanted to look up, but I think that's also a war crime, right? Like if you're a medic and you have the protection of wearing that insignia, you're not supposed to take the helmet off and then start killing enemy, enemy soldiers. He does that. Um, basically, the only people that are left um, of the American side at the end of the war are Sergeant Zack, um, the black and a Asian soldier, and this other guy named Baldy, and that's a whole other thing. But um, the final image, oh, and, and Sergeant Zack um, ends up, go, he has shell shock. He starts hallucinating that he's back in World War II. 
So it's this completely non-triumphal ending, and this is the final image of military multiculturalism that the film leaves us with. And it is, in fact, a very chastened image. It's, 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 you know, I'll just read this last paragraph. It's rather fitting that this first Korean War film concludes with such a chastened image of interracial brotherhood. Like virtually all war films, The Steel Helmet affirms, above all, the sentiment of brotherhood that connects men on the field of combat, an intimacy that emerges out of being subjected to, witnessing, and also committing acts of horrendous violence. But even as it asserts the value of these male-male bonds, it evinces an uncertainty over the va ultimate value of the larger cause for the which the war is being fought. The connections that emerge between American fighting men are not the only forms of interracial intimacy that the film is interested in. The film also invites its viewers to invest in the bonds that Zach forms with Short Round and the North Korean Major. And in the larger project from which my talk today is drawn, it's, um, it's, the, nature, it's the various forms of interracial and transnational intimacy that I'm interested in examining. As it turns out, there was a good number there were a good number of compelling dramas of race that the theater of war proved particularly suited for staging. All these were, in a sense, family dramas testifying to the great potential that America had for drawing blacks, whites, and Asians together into a peaceable coexistence, not only as fellow soldiers, anti-communists, Democrats, and capitalists, but also as brothers and sisters, wives and husbands, and parents and children. Um, so thank you.